Hi. Uh, so scaling a web app, 15 million page views. Uh, I am Steven Perlson. I'm a senior web engineer at Mixit. Um, kind of means I work on internal and external web uh, software. I recently did the new help system that Mixit users will encounter. And I work as the lead developer and maintainer of a, a Mixit product called Launch. And Launch is what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to talk why Launch is important to Mixit. I'm going to give some examples of what Launch does, uh, its benefits for Mixit. And then I'm going to dig into examples of where we had issues uh, in the code, the infrastructure, the data, and one little extra one. And these are sort of experiences that we encountered with regards to scaling Launch. And then I'll just summarize everything as lessons learned. So why does Launch exist? Well, what is Mixit? Uh, Mixit, the client, allows you to do three things. You have your one-to-one -one chats. You have your many-to-many -many group chats. But there are also apps. And the apps is an interesting field. Um, and we have a thing called Mixit Portal Apps. So, and you can see in the picture there, we have four different kinds. Uh, sort of brand awareness type apps uh, that are part of marketing. And they allow uh, two-way communications with users. So, for example, uh, a user can subscribe to an application and can enter competitions, and the user will submit forms and submit uh, images and so on. And the application can, in turn, send messages back to its users. So there's a two-way communication now with an entity. And the entity can be a person behind the app, or more likely it's a business. Um, so what are Mixed Portal apps? Well, they're just websites. There's nothing really special about them, except there are some Mixit-specific uh, tags in play. And you can see the Mixit-specific tags. There's a target href there. It has a Mixit protocol. And that just gets used when the HTML is transformed for the Mixit client. So we have a proxy server known as the Web Gateway. And that fetches the... HTML that's been served up for the app, uh, the portal app, and that gets transformed into the Mixit protocol. So effectively, you are having a conversation, the instant messaging conversation, using the Mixit client, but with a web, uh, web face, uh, so HTML there, um, which is an interesting way of dealing with this type of logic. Uh, there are different types of apps. Uh, people have created games. Uh, but when it comes to launch, it's all about brands and marketing. So there's, there's a lot of those types of apps going on. So what is launch? Launch is a portal app builder. So in other words, a user can sign up and can create an application. And that application will be hosted by launch and will be rendered by launch when, to the users that are viewing those apps. And we have an administration dashboard. Uh, it's backed by MongoDB as a data store. We have some uh, queuing going on when we have to send out broadcast messaging. We have RabbitMQ and Celery to take care of that. We have certain page types that need to be updated regularly. So we have Twitter pages, RSS pages. We have some extra little bits around. And we tie very heavily into the Mixed APIs. Uh, so a user will log into launch, create a new application, and that creation of the new application is actually provisioning an application in Mixit. And when the user changes the app's avatar, we're actually changing it in Mixit. So there's a high degree of integration there. So a bit more of the architecture. I mentioned MongoDB and the queuing with RabbitMQ and Celery. We're also using Elastic Cache with Memcache. And we have uh, Elastic Beanstalk as our sort of infrastructure to scale our web servers. The web servers themselves, we're using M1 Smalls. Uh, we found we don't need any more than that. But we do have two of them running at all times. Um, we, on each server, we have all three websites running. We have our administration console. We have launch itself, which is the site builder and the user's dashboard. And we have the rendering service, all running off the same instances that get created. So let's look at a little bit of the uh, scale that we're dealing with. Uh, oh, the scale that we're dealing with is. 
So this is just December 2013 to August 2014. We're dealing with monthly page views hitting around 10 million. In May, we hit up to over 14. And I'll zoom into May so you can see a little bit of the pattern. And the pattern is a sawtooth. And about 3 in the morning is your low point. Then it sort of spikes a bit for breakfast. Lunchtime, there's another dip. Evening, it goes up again. The, the early evening is the busiest time. The really high spikes that you're seeing, uh, you can sort of maybe think of that, maybe there's a marketing campaign that's happening and there's some ads, banner ads that are pushing users towards a launch hosted uh, application. Uh, a little bit more on May in particular. Uh, sessions, almost six million sessions, over one and a half million unique users and well over 14.3 million page views. And that's just one month, May 2014. Uh, let me just go back a bit. So that's sort of where we are at the moment with launch. And development of launch proper sort of slowed down. There's more maintenance mode now. Uh, but launch didn't start out uh, where it is. It didn't start out in Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, there were a few other things that weren't in play. Uh, launch started out as a prototype, and we took the prototype and we continued development of it till it turned into what it currently is. And so for our infrastructure, we had two web servers and we scaled them manually. So what would happen is marketing would tell us that a campaign was going to come online and that campaign was pointing towards a launch hosted website, um, a portal application that launch was hosting. And Brad would add more service to the mix. Thanks, Brad. And we didn't have more than two MongoDB servers. Right now, we're running a few more MongoDB servers with some sharding in, in place. Um, so yeah, it started out very small, and it built up very fast. Uh, a small team of developers working really hard, implementing a lot of features over the course of well over a year to get it where it is now. Uh, so back to a few more stats. Uh, these are three apps. And this is a logarith logarithmic scale. So at the top is 100,000, at the bottom sort of 100. Um, so you look at the red app. The red app is a little bit unusual. We only have a, a few apps like that that are hosted on launch. Uh, so this is the same time period, December 2013 to August 2014. These are weekly counts. Uh, so the red app spikes almost up to 100,000 page views per week, probably closer on average around about 70 to 80,000. Uh, that red app is a service application. In, the, in this case, it actually has a link on the Mixer client. That's why it gets so much traffic. So it's highly unusual. The green app spikes over 10,000 weekly page views over the time period. The green app would, you can think of as a well-respected brand application somebody that has done a lot of advertising, pushed a lot of traffic towards themselves. The blue app is the more regular type of app. Um, over 1,000 pages per week, uh, quite easy to get there with a little bit of effort. Um, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, these are the minority of the apps that are hosted on launch. Most of launches apps, and they're under 2,000 apps hosted on launch. They are not published, they're only beta and they don't ever get above a few handful of users subscribed to them. So it's the few number that actually add up to all the page views we're getting. Anyway, that's enough of the background of what launch is and why launch is important. Uh, let's go into some examples of where things have gone wrong. The first one I'm going to talk about is caching. And the second one is some interesting uh, little front-end stuff uh, that have caught us off guard. So caching wasn't forgotten. It was a, we'll do it later. Uh, so it started off as a prototype. Launch was a prototype. And the prototype was developed very quickly. No caching. Everything just read out of the database. And yeah, so <laughs> we realized very soon early that we needed to get some caching involved in this. So we looked into what was required, and we decided we could cache pages as they come out, we could cache the database queries, but we needed a certain amount of dynam dynamic flexibility. 
So a little bit of how launch actually works. A page in launch is actually a JSON blob. Uh, the launch front end, the page designer, the site builder, has that entire blob. You manipulate it in memory, essentially, in the user interface, and it sends it back and it updates. That's great for the front end. You deal with it nice and easily. It's great for storing in MongoDB because it's just a JSON blob. Unfortunately, when you have to render that page, there's a lot going on. There's a whole lot of metadata. The page is made up of more JSON, which are the widgets in the page. You need to loop through all those widgets and render each one out to HTML. And so reading from the database is fairly slow. Rendering the HTML is fairly slow. So we had issues like that. And it's good to make note of the fact that a launch application can be deployed, production, ready to go live, or ready to be advertised, and it will have no page views. No one will visit it. But an advertising campaign will go out with a banner ad linking to that application, and it will go from zero page views to thousands of page views in a matter of minutes. So the level of scale that we're dealing with is quite dramatic. So caching was tricky. We looked at Varnish, a simple front end, cache everything as it is required, and we decided that it wouldn't work as well for our requirements. Uh, we need to cater for differences in the mix of clients. Uh, principally, we wanted to cater for resolution differences, so output different HTML, different image sizes to those clients. We also needed to take care of server-side analytics, and this was a problem for multiple reasons, uh, especially after we moved to an image-based uh, analytics page tracking. So we needed to be able to break Mixit's heavy caching. Uh, Mixit wants to cache images, uh, the, that proxy server that Mixit uses for the portal applications. It wants to cache as much as possible. We have to break through that. And to break through that, you need to be quite dynamic and put in cache bun uh, busting values in your URLs. So the approach we took a little bit of both. Uh, we cache the slow bits that get rendered. We don't cache the entire page. We don't cache the footer. Uh, we cache a unique page for every client type that gets created. Uh, so there's a lot of cache pages. Uh, our memcache gets bashed quite heavily. Um, but what's useful about that is we have the ability to be a little more dynamic. Uh, we also have a very good routine now that we can pass it a URL of a page and it will remove out of cache all those instances of that, URL, of that page. So we all have about seven or eight different pages that get created for each client type and we are, um, it's quite nice that it actually removes them all out of cache and forces a recreation. So when we, we would want that to be done, uh, when the user has updated the page and pushed publish, so we want a new version of the page live. Uh, or when one of the uh, tasks runs and you have to update the Twitter page or the RSS page. So there's new values to show the user we want it out of cache. So a new uh, page is generated. So the advantages, custom footers. And the custom footers means that we can stick in very easily and very quickly uh, different tracking tags. So the tracking tag in this case is images. And I'll, I'll talk more about the analytics later. We weren't always using images. Um, we do have special tags in the, the generated HTML that we do a search and replace on. It's not the nicest solution, but it does mean we don't need to re-render the entire JSON blob into HTML each time. The solution is dynamic enough for us, and it's also fast enough. And just an example of the times we're dealing with here, a uncached page will generate in about 0.2 of a second. The cached page will generate in 100 times faster. So that's the caching side of things. Uh, it took quite a while to get the caching right, and we still encounter a few bugs with the, the caching validation. Um, I mentioned we're running multiple servers. Uh, we have our render server, and that URL is different to our launch server, and our caching validation wasn't working from the launch server. So certain pages would not actually be cleared out of cache and we had little issues there. Uh, it's always fun finding bugs like that six months after the fact. So uh, yeah, maintenance always happening. 
So side effects in the front end. Uh, the front end of launch, and this is the, the user's dashboard where they create applications and where they uh, edit their pages and create new pages. Uh, that front end is all Angular. And I don't know how, it, you look at the project now and you, you kind of wonder how else would it have been developed. Uh, you're so used to that project now using AngularJS. Uh, but the problem is, back then when the prototype was built, um, and as we started pro development proper on it, we were all very inexperienced with AngularJS. Uh, we didn't understand some of the pitfalls. And one of those pitfalls happens to be the two-way binding. Now, two-way binding is nice. There's less complexity around it. A lot of people would say it's dangerous, and it is. Um, and I've already mentioned that our pages are JSON blobs. And we load up the entire JSON blob, and the JSON blob isn't that small. We load it up into a model in the front end, and that model is rendered into a site builder structure where the user can go around and play with the widgets and move them around, set metadata, add more widgets to it, remove widgets, and so on. And that's great, but we have a watcher on that model, and that watcher fires whenever there changes. And what was happening was we noticed this happening a few times in the past, and we sort of wondered why was this happening. So what was happening was you would load a page into the site builder and you would want to, to edit it, and it would load up. And after a second, your entire structure, the widgets and everything would just disappear, and then a few seconds later it would reappear. And you start, okay, what's going on here? You look at the traffic that's going out of your web browser, and you realize it's calling the update routine three or four times in a row. And while it's a problem is the update routine is a brute force update of the page. It, the front end, the, the AngularJS application is literally sending the entire page JSON blob back to the server and it's been saved. So it's a massive amount of data going back from the client, the user's computer, to the server getting saved. And that's happening about four times in a row. And we weren't quite sure what, why this was happening at the time. And so I was working with another developer at the time on this project, and he was doing all the front end stuff, and I was doing the back end stuff. Um, and none of us had time to look into this in depth. We could not fix it at the time because we had other features to put in place. And by the time we had time to do this, the other developer, who was much more familiar with AngularJS, had left, leaving me to have to figure this out by myself. Um, it took a lot longer than I expected. Uh, but we finally got to the bottom of it. The, what was happening was uh, the JSON blob would be loaded into the model. The watcher would be at, attached to it already. And for some obscure reason, some value inside the model would be changed or updated or added to. And that would cause the watcher to fire off the update event. Nothing really tricky about that, but it was happening a few times in a whole load of places inside the JavaScript. And it took a while to figure out exactly where it was all happening and to bypass it when you loaded up the page the first time. But when it finally got that sorted out, it was really nice just to have the page load up nice and fast, and know that we've minimized the number of um, extraneous update calls happening to the back end. So in summary of part one, uh, so try and discover extraneous network calls and resolve them. Uh, reduce communication. Uh, there's no reason besides being a little bit lazy that we are sending the entire JSON blob as an update back to the server. We could do a lot better by only sending back the changed bits. So we're wasting a lot of bandwidth by doing that. We're not too concerned about it because of our usage uh, patterns with the launch dashboard. Um, there's very few actual owners of apps compared to the number of people that view the apps. So we don't, we're not too concerned about it. But if the dashboard and was much more used, we would have to worry about it because it would seriously affect our performance. And then cache from the beginning, uh, because caching introduces some other side effects that you'll never know until you start caching, and it's rather to get that done early. So code, 
code is nice and easy. Code you can change at any time. If you have to, you change your language completely, you change your stack completely. It's an easy change. Um, at least that's where I see it. I'm a software developer, so I see code is very flexible. Uh, data, not so much. So when you make a mistake in your data, you kind of have to figure out how you're going to solve it. Um, so we use MongoDB. We didn't always use MongoDB. Uh, we were storing those JSON blobs in MySQL. That was very painful. Uh, <laughs> that was a weird prototyping decision. We moved very quickly across to MongoDB. Uh, the main decision there was we needed a way of editing the data on the database. Uh, you just could not do that storing text blobs in MySQL. Um, so we have a database for every app. So if you register and log into launch and you create an application, we actually create a separate database, MongoDB database, for your application. We store reference to that application in a central database. The central database has our user logins, and it used to have a collection of members. And members in this case are Mixit users that have subscribed to an application that's hosted on launch. And then they've interacted with that application so that we have actually seen that person and captured the information. So the members collection was quite large after a while. Each member had a subarray of documents for each application they touched. And we store things like the last active date for that user for that application. And we hit a problem because we had a few million users in this table. In fact, we had close to five million users in the table. And we had lots of indexes that collect that database, the central database was growing really big. Uh, I think it was, I guess now, just a while ago, about 20 gigs or so. Uh, we wanted to reclaim that space. Um, and we, so we needed to do something. Now the classic approach would have been just to shard it. But the way we had structured the user data, the member data, uh, meant sharding wasn't really going to work out very well. Um, we did update MongoDB, so at least counting on that member uh, collection helped a bit, uh, but not enough. We always had problems. So the decision was made to move out the member data, the members themselves, into each application database. So in other words, turning it slightly around, we don't need to store a subarray of, of apps for each member. We just store the member data itself in each application. It's a form of sharding, in a sense, because now we are increasing the number of members, though, but we are putting them into where they belong. Uh, so each application now is more full-featured. It has more of its own data. Uh, it took months to prepare and plan out. Because uh, it was always the concern that there, something w would go wrong. So there's a lot of planning involved with this. It was a live system. We couldn't afford to lose any, any uptime or lose any data. So we planned it out very carefully. Uh, we did it in four distinct steps. There was a lot more to it than just these four steps. This is summarized down. Uh, very basically, you duplicate your rights to your old and your new. You migrate your data across. So you have a matching bit of data in your old collection and your new collection. You, once you've got your data aligned, you can start reading from your new collection. And at each point of this, these steps, you're making sure that everything is working perfectly, lots of tests and everything. And then when you're finally satisfied with every, everything, you clean up your old data. And in our case, we actually recreated the central collection in order to reclaim our space because MongoDB doesn't do any sort of compaction. <laughs> so if, you, if it's claimed data for itself, hard drive space for itself, it keeps it. Um, so there was other things we did with this. Uh, the the four-step approach, fairly good standard technique for doing this, but we did domain-specific enhancements as well. Uh, certain apps, I mentioned that massive uh, app during, in the beginning that's a service application, it gets close to 100,000 uh, page views a week. That application will never send out broadcast information. The only reason we store member data is so that we can do broadcast messaging from the application to the app's members. And we don't need to do it for our biggest application. So I literally hard-coded a skip over all the member stuff for that application. So that saves a lot of effort and 
time in the in the processing of the member data. We also don't update the member data too often. We store data in, uh, in memcache to make sure that members don't update too frequently. So in summary, doesn't matter how much you plan ahead, <laughs> you're gonna have to make changes. Uh, things break at scale. You never know how something's gonna react. Um, in order to be successful with a data migration, you need to understand the data, your database, your schema, uh, how your software is using it, uh, and most importantly, uh, first sign of trouble, start planning. Um, that's something I've st still struggled to do. Uh, first sign of trouble, you really need to look into why it's happening, figure out, get your metrics in order, and find the source of it and plan for it. So, I talked about code, I talked about data, uh, and I mentioned how easy code is to change, I mentioned how not so easy data is to change. Um, for me, I'm not an ops person, so when I talk about infrastructure, it's something that's very hard to change. Um, I'm of the opinion that once I've installed something on a server, that's it, <laughs> it's gonna stay there. So when we have to do another um, infrastructure change or we need to implement a new server, it's, a, it's not in my mindset to think that this is easy. Um, so I mentioned in the beginning as well that we are manually scaling our web servers and that wasn't gonna last for very long. We needed to figure out a way of automating the process of scaling and our solution is pretty much Amazon specific because everything else is on Amazon. And so we tasked one of our developers to look into CloudFormation. And he got pretty far with it. Uh, he got some custom AMIs built, and an AMI, for those who don't know, is your uh, custom uh, server image with all the software that you need installed on it, so we can bring up new instances quite easily. We weren't very confident in the approach. Um, we did learn some valuable lessons, though. And I watched that dev suffer <laughs> through this process. Um, before we had finished, we started looking into Elastic Beanstalk, and it was much simpler. Uh, managed to get a version of our launch application and websites running on Elastic Beanstalk without too much trouble. So Elastic Beanstalk is a simpler front end for cloud formation. Gives you Elastic Load Balancer. Scaling rules are much simpler to figure out. Uh, with CloudFormation, you have to you have to sort of tweak XML config files with uh, Elastic Beanstalk. It gives you a much nicer interface. It's not to say it's easier; it's simpler. Uh, so, if, for example, you for some reason you decide that you're going to use a T1 micro or T2 micro to host your application, and your application is a simple PHP website you're gonna run out of CPU before you run out of bandwidth. That's because of that instance type. If you run on a M1 small, you're gonna run out of bandwidth before you run out of CPU. So getting the scaling rules right was a lot of trial and error. Uh, we used um, an M1 small for our instance type and we decided to take a fairly slow approach to it. We kept it on the default scaling rules and then we looked at how our server reacted. Uh, what was the monitoring saying about the CPU usage, the uh, bandwidth usage, and then we started tweaking the numbers in the scaling rules and until we got something that seemed to kick in at the right times, and that's where we left it. So your scaling is gonna depend on the application that you're running, the uh, languages, the, the framework, the stack that you've chosen, and it's gonna depend on the instance type that you selected. Um, the deployment's a lot simpler as well. Uh, I had it set up that I could uh, do a git push to our uh, Elastic Beanstalk application. Uh, that was quite nice until our uh, GitHub, uh, Git repo became too large and when it needed to do a full install and I'd sit there waiting 20 minutes for it to slowly push it up to the server. Um, uh, and then it started failing, so I'm not sure what happened, but that's beside the point because you can zip up your source code and upload it into through the dashboard, uh, the Amazon Elastic Beanstalk application dashboard, and it will take care of it for you. Uh, that's what most of the other team members do when they do deployments onto Elastic Beanstalk. They 
just bundle it up into a zip file, stick it onto the server. Um, so simple deployment. Uh, we do have some custom install scripts. Our install for a server takes an inordinately long amount of time to get uh, finished, uh, but we're doing some uh, custom software installs on each server. We uh, have our virtual host set up as well, so we needed to figure out a way of getting an Elastic Beanstalk PHP application server to run three websites. And we were very happy when we got that working. Uh, we did make some mistakes, uh, learned a lot of lessons the first time around, because we've done this a few times now. Um, the one thing that stands out for me is when you create an Elastic Beanstalk application, it gives you default security groups. And we started using those security groups when we wanted to link other services together, and the thing there is don't use them. Don't touch those security groups. Create your own elsewhere and use the other ones because those security groups will lock your uh, instance, your, your application, into your other services and you find it very difficult to delete your Elastic Beanstalk environment. So in summary, uh, I say small teams there, but I actually mean teams that don't have ops people. So any team that doesn't have a dedicated ops person, they have to reduce the admin burden somehow. Um, and using infrastructure as a service uh, tools such as Elastic Beanstalk is one approach. Uh, you could use Heroku as another option. So there are quite a few of these players out there. You just pick one. You might not even need an infrastructure as a service. You might only need a platform as a service, like Google, Google's App Engine. So the last one is other opportunities for scale. And I wanted to raise this one. And I find this one the most interesting, because it had the nicest solution in the end. And that's separation of concerns. Um, doesn't really tell you what I did, though. So launch, very modular. Doesn't always start out modular. Um, the idea is you identify high traffic items, functions that are using a lot of bandwidth. You're calling them often. They are singularly unique in their functionality. And you either optimize them or move them out onto their own server. So in our case, we did that with an analytics. Uh, analytics have to run server side. And originally, we were doing the analytics in line with our page request. So the Mixer client, uh, the user would open up the application. The application, would, the request would go through the proxy server, the web gateway. The web gateway would say, OK, I'll go and fetch the page for this application. That page request would hit our server, and the server would say, OK, yes, the HTML, but before I send it to you, I'll just go and hit Google Analytics quickly to track the page. And that was a little bit irritating. Um, so performance, a little bit of a drop. You're adding about 100 milliseconds onto your time, because now you're waiting for that curl request to go off to Google Analytics. Um, it has to be done server side because of what I just said now, that, that proxy server, that web gateway, you're losing out on some of the uh, features in the handset. In the handset, the mixer client, you don't have JavaScript, and you don't have uh, cookies on images, which is another problem that I encountered. Um, we did update very quickly to using image tags, and the image tags meant we were getting multiple hits to our server each time, because now the image tag pointed to the, our same launch server and the rendering engine, and we would get multiple page hits. And now you think, oh, page request and then one hit for the image tag for, to track the page view. And not really. We have, at most, three extra page hits because we are doing analytics for globally for launch, our own internal analytics. We, do, we allow owners of apps to plug in their own analytics. So that's the second page hit after the initial one. Uh, and we do alternative page tracking as well. So we handle the effective measure for some of our clients. So in practice, up to four page hits. <laughs> so that's a heck of a lot of extra traffic coming through to our server. Um, so we improved it. And, and the first thing we did was make it more modular. We int uh, implemented the image tag option. 
And that made a lot of sense for uh, performance of the page. So if you were loading this in a web browser, not the Mixer client, the page would load faster because you wouldn't see the image requests because they'd happen in the background. Uh, that didn't make any sense for the Mixer client itself because the proxy server, the web gateway, has to get everything so it can convert that into the uh, Mixer protocol. So it was a step, though, at the start. The next step, though, is we moved the analytics, the image tag handling stuff, onto its own server. A very stripped down bit of PHP just to handle the analytics serving. Um, and it does analytics, it does um, the other one that I mentioned, and so on. So there are a few things happening there. That's quite nice. Uh, then I discovered the measurements protocol. How, show of hands, how many of you know about Google Analytics measurements protocol? OK, only a handful. Uh, turns out with the latest version of Google Analytics, and the latest version of Google Analytics I think was released in like 2011 or something, so it's not new. Um, there's still people that have not updated their Google Analytics accounts to the new version, which kind of sucks, and you'll see why now. Um, <laughs> but we looked into it. We had to. We wanted to implement the new uh, API for tracking of stats um, for Google Analytics, and we figured we'd start off with the API call, just change it over to the new one, and that'll be that. Because at a certain point, the old one will stop working. Um, I think it's still a little way off, though. And while I was busy doing this, I noticed that the measurements protocol gives you the option of calling a page view to track a page via a get call, which I thought was quite unusual. Because um, up till then, I'd been doing a post to the API endpoint, and that would be the page tracking. And now, all of a sudden, they're telling me, well, you can stick everything that you require, no cookie required in that call, uh, in a get parameter, and I noticed that get parameter, they don't tell you this anywhere, but that get parameter returns an image for you, a one pixel transparent image. So yeah, a few things clicked together and I realized we don't need to be calling our server at all. We can just stick this as the source image for our page tracking instead of calling, instead of calling our server, uh, which we, I did. And the improvements, the load on our analytics server was quite remarkable. We dropped down at least, you see that, it's like a mass, massive drop. So uh, very happy <laughs> with the improvement. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, take all of our Google Analytics hits over to the measurements protocol because the measurements protocol only works for the people who have upgraded the analytics accounts. So if you're still running the old analytics, the measurements protocol, the data feeding into it just disappears, which is not nice. So we, <laughs> we actually did deploy a version of this uh, code which used the measurements protocol for the um, app owners. And a few days later, we discovered nobody was getting any stats, <laughs> which is not nice. So we reverted quickly, and they were on their way. So, in summary, for extra opportunities, uh, identify your heavily used and easily separated parts of your systems. Uh, try and split them out if you can. We identified analytics. And look out for updated or third-party services that can sort of negate some of your uh, need to host it locally for yourself. Uh, make your system simpler. So that was the measurements protocol. Another example that I didn't mention was um, Mixit has a new API for broadcast messaging, which means all of our broadcasts that go out to all of an application's members, we no longer need to use our own queue for that. We just send off one API call to Mixit and does it for us. Uh, that was a, a really nice enhancement to assist their system, and it dropped our requirements quite a lot. So finally, lessons learned. Identify and question any extraneous network calls. Uh, try and reduce your com uh, communication to a minimum. Uh, don't leave important aspects for later. Uh, things like caching, try and do from the start. The other thing you should do from the start would be security. Uh, understand your domain and take care of problems quickly. 
and figure out your crunch points and do something about them.